It's time for an authentic, genuine narrative that is grounded in our religion to reflect our proud Canadian Muslim identity. If you don't tell your story, someone else will. It's time we hold the pen. Writing our own narrative transforms everything. The way we see ourselves, the way we ground ourselves, the way we project ourselves, and the way others see us. The Max Scholar Summit is a 10-day trilingual program with a lineup of 30 speakers who will lead discussions on fiqh, identity, and spirituality. Get ready for a series that will move your heart, motivate you to think, inspire you to act. Register today on macnet.ca. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the Max Scholar Summit today. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-musaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a great pleasure to have uh, with us today Dr. Tariq Swaydan, if you're tuning in, to have uh, him uh, present a wonderful topic on the model leader of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before we go into the program and the details, uh, this is a live program. Uh, but also a translation is available. Uh, so if you click just below, there's a link for the translation, and then there's a tab for interpretation, and we have live translation in both French and Arabic language, and uh, and the lecture will be in English, inshallah. We always begin by uh, the recitation of the Quran, and today I'd like to introduce uh, a young brother from class 7B of the Mac Olive Grove School, uh, Yamam Sahlul, who will be reciting the Quran for us uh, today. Assalamu أعوذ بالله من الشيطان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا ولما رأى المؤمنون الأحزاب قالوا قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله وصدق الله ورسوله وما زادهم إلا إيمانا وتسليما من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عاهدوا الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا ليجزي الله الصادقين بصدقهم ويعذب المنافقين إن شاء أو يتوب عليهم إن الله كان غفورا رحيما صدق الله العظيم Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you have, an, you have an excellent example for whoever has hope in Allah on the last day and remembers Allah often. When the believers saw the enemy alliance, they said, This is what Allah and His Messenger had promised us. The promise of Allah and His Messenger has come true. And this only increased them in faith and submission. Among the believers are men who have proven true to what they pledged to Allah. Some of them have fulfilled their pledge with their lives. Others are waiting their turn. They have never changed their commitment in the least. It all happened so Allah can reward the faithful for their faithfulness and punish the hypocrites if he wills or turn to them in mercy. Surely, Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. This is from Surah Al-Ahzab, uh, Ayahs 21 to 24. Jazakumullah khairan. MashaAllah, barakallahu MashaAllah. For that beautiful recitation and translation. Uh, welcome. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. If you're joining us, we are live on YouTube at the Max Scholars Summit, which is a program uh, put together over a period of the holidays from uh, yesterday until January the 2nd 
every day where we hear from our beloved scholars and teachers who give us uh, excellent advice and practical things that we can learn. And today, we're very blessed to have with us Dr. Tariq Mohammed Aswedan from uh, Kuwait, a very well-known, influential uh, leader and uh, teacher for the Muslim world uh, in, in many places, of course, uh, through different means as well, including television series. Um, we're presenting this uh, live on YouTube, but also via translation, live translation in both French and Arabic. If you can click the link below in the uh, uh, below the screen on the YouTube, uh, you'll be able to then select via interpretation tab which language you want to receive live translation and uh, benefit from the presentation today. Also, uh, all of the talks from the Scholar Summit will be available online on the YouTube channel. Uh, so I encourage you to please uh, subscribe, uh, click notifications so you can get updated and uh, stay tuned and also give us uh, some likes. The Scholar Summit takes place uh, over the next several days and there's different times in the schedule, uh, but if you miss something, you can always come back and find it on the YouTube channel. Um, by way of overview, the Muslim Association of Canada is a, a Canadian faith-based charity focusing on serving Canadians by educating and motivating Muslims in Canada to put their faith into action and benefit everyone. I'm your host, uh, Khurram Khan, for today and moderator. And there will be a chance to ask questions. I encourage you to put questions uh, uh, on the chat and we will compile them uh, at the end for Dr. Thoratarik Swedan to cover. Today's topic is uh, on the role model uh, example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the model leader that we, we all have. As a global ummah with so many personalities, influencers and leaders, it's easy to be attracted to charismatic personalities and adopt different leaders. Perhaps we seek the most relevant expert in different areas in our life. However, within the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the most beautiful and holistic leader we can find. So today, it's an honor to welcome uh, Dr. Tariq Al-Swedan to give us and explore the prophet, a prophetic example and uh, how we can benefit from the most relevant leader of all time, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Please remember to uh, ask us the questions. The live uh, translation will be starting shortly, and uh, uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from Dr. Tariq Sudan. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Akhi. Jazakallahu khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Well, good afternoon to you, uh, to our good evening in our time. It's 10.30 now uh, at our time. And um, uh, I'm in Kuwait, uh, speaking from uh, my home. And uh, it's very cold outside, by the way. It's uh, seven degrees only. Uh, many people think Kuwait is only hot. It's very hot in summer. We reach 50 degrees. And in winter, we reach zero <laughs> centigrade. So um, uh, it's going to, give it, uh, to be colder even in the next few days, as they mentioned. Um, but I, um, I mentioned this because I really love the cold weather. And that's why I always enjoy being in Canada whenever I can. I uh, visited Canada more than 40 times at least. And uh, it, is my, it is one of my wishes in life. Maybe one day to, if I decide to retire, uh, to retire in, in Canada because uh, uh, Canada is a model country for me, please. And um, I, I believe that you are very fortunate to live in Canada. Canada is... Uh, very moderate, uh, very uh, understanding, very accommodating, uh, very advanced, uh, really a model country and uh, uh, very respective uh, of all uh, creeds and all um, ways of life. Um, uh, this uh, diversity that you have in Canada is just beautiful. And um, I, I, I congratulate you and congratulating the, the Canadian government on, on being so uh, so moderate in all areas of life and so considerate. And also, uh, it has shown to be a humane country when it comes to refugees and come to human uh, causes. Uh, Canada also is took a great stance when it comes to dictatorships and standing against them, um, um, which is not something that was taken by other uh, Western governments. So again, uh, my, uh, I congratulate you to be in Canada. And uh, again, uh, this is, to, if I'm asked today, where, wish, where would you wish to live besides Kuwait? I would say Canada, definitely. Um, uh, 
whether it's in Vancouver, the beautiful city, or in in one of the cold cities that I've visited, uh, it's all it's all good to me because I, I really enjoy cold weather. Uh, so enjoy the cold weather as we speak. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I am giving uh, given 40 minutes, and I, I told them I'm very precise on my time, so I will use the 40 minutes, not more, inshallah. And uh, let me, uh, since I am trying to be as scholarly as possible, let me share with you <coughs> this presentation about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the model leader. Um, I have done, alhamdulillah, uh, huge research on this issue. Um, I've written uh, 125 books that are published and about 22 other books that have not been published. Ten of them are on leadership um, and um, three of them on the leadership of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So um, <clears throat> I, I try to dig deep into leadership. I try to understand it. And um, one of my uh, books that are coming, inshallah, in uh, two volumes is The Secrets of the Leadership of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is detailing how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, actually practiced all the modern uh, theories and uh, uh, practices of leadership that are taught today to the utmost level and to the highest model. The reason I am mentioning uh, this and the reason for this whole lecture is a message to young men and women um, and uh, to parents that uh, you should follow this model. And my hope is that among you will uh, be the future leaders of the Ummah. I had the pleasure of training more than 100,000. And uh, wallahi, believe me, I'm, I'm t I always mention this, that among those that I trained, the highest level is those who, those Muslims who live in Western countries. Because you had the opportunity to join two civilizations, the Muslim civilization, which was the greatest, and the Western civilization, which is ruling the world today. Uh, so you're very advanced on science, on math, on, on uh, leadership, on, uh, on research, on, in every area of life. And uh, at the same time, you are joining this with the Islamic values that uh, you still believe in, and uh, you take it from the Quran, which was, uh, uh, mashallah, the beautiful example of the young man who recited the Quran for us in beautiful Arabic and in excellent English. This is what we're looking for, the joining of the two civilizations. And we want these, uh, this joining to have a role model. And the greatest role model that we can present to the world is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I have studied in the, uh, in the West. I, I, I studied in, I, I took my high school from the United States all the way to my PhD. I lived in the United States for 17 years. And I was a member of the uh, Management Association, uh, American Management Association. I was a member of the uh, uh, American Training and Development Society. And I studied leadership and management there besides my PhD in engineering. And wallahi, believe me, what I am going to present to you is something that comes from the West. But I want to show the, the, the prophetic example so we can, I can show you how we join forces. We, we, there, there, is no, uh, there is no contradiction. There is no uh, aggression among civilizations. There is no clash of civilizations. There, there is a complementation. And we believe that we can complement each other. We are not in a quarrel. We are in a, a quarrel against bad leadership, against terrorism, against uh, uh, occupation. Uh, that's what we are after. We are not in a clash with the West. And as a matter of fact, you give us the greatest example of being Muslims to the deepest level and Canadians 
loyal Canadian, Canadians to your country. That's what we're looking for. And I, I hope that uh, uh, this message have uh, reached every Muslim and Alhamdulillah, many scholars have talked about this and I hope inshallah, this will be deeply rooted in the future generations. Let me go uh, directly into the lecture and uh, let me uh, present to you the research on leadership. When it comes to leadership, uh, there is a detail, the, the highest level among so many research on leadership, the highest research at all is the one that was done by Causes and Posner, which continues more than 30 years. Uh, the, uh, it was applied on uh, more than 1.5 million people. And they identified the five practices of the model leaders of exemplary leadership. Uh, this uh, model that they presented, uh, the, the degree of uh, authenticity of this uh, or verification of this research is 97.4%, which is the highest among all research. The next research to that is 93%. So the, the, this is the highest level of research and it is a continuous research. They, they update it every year. It is published uh, uh, continuously in a book that is revised continuously and uh, it's called uh, the leadership challenge the leadership challenge and you can you can find it in, uh, in chapters i always shop in chapters <laughs> so you can find it there right let's let's go directly to the five practices and see how these things apply to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the, again they were checked again and again and they stood the test of time and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has all these attributes and much, much more. When I say much, much more, there is uh, the, the details of this uh, is a series of lectures that I have done. And before I go into the five practices, uh, there was another study about, uh, about leadership uh, the, and they identified 225 characteristics of great leaders. Uh, being a student of uh, history, I have written um, more than 20 books on history, and uh, I'm uh, uh, currently writing the Encyclopedia of Islamic History, uh, seven volumes. We finished four already, alhamdulillah. Uh, I do looked into the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu from 200 books, and believe me, every characteristics of uh, every characteristic of these 20, 125 are in the Prophet Sallallahu and even more. So this is why we Muslims adore Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, love him to the deepest because he is the example of leadership, of humanity. He is the, he is the savior, the true savior for humanity. But I don't have the time to go through all of this, so I, I will jump into these and uh, see some, some applications of this, very quick application from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, in hopes that you apply it in yourselves and we apply it in ourselves and our beloved ones and we uh, train the future generation on it. Just a few quick ideas before we uh, I continue. This is something that I will insert from my, uh, my studies, uh, this is not from Poses and Posner. What is leadership? There are so many definitions of leadership, but my own definition of leadership is, it is the ability to move people towards goals. So leadership is an ability. This is not something that you read in books. If you read, if you read a thousand books on leadership, <laughs> you will not be a leader if you don't have this ability. Now the question is, is this ability, ability born with you or is it something that you acquire through your training, upbringing, et cetera? And the answer to this is for most people, more than 98%, it is something that you acquire. But for the, the, the exception, one to 2%, it is born with them. So this is just a quick, uh, quick note. Another quick note on this uh, definition is, all leaders have goals. 
every leader has a has goals now whether these goals as are good or bad that will determine if they are good leaders or bad leaders so some leaders have good goals uh, to improve their country to improve society to improve humanity etc while others their goals is to enjoy uh, uh, the desires of life for them and for their families and for uh, uh, those supporting them etc so uh, and that brings us to a very important definition of what are what is the definition of bad leadership because there is good bad good leadership which is the exception by the way and the majority of leaders in every aspect of life in the history in history and today unfortunately most people most leaders are bad leaders bad leaders are three kinds of leaders either they have bad goals which makes them bad leaders or bad ethics and that also will make them bad leaders but there is the exception where there is somebody who is who has good intentions excellent goals great ethics but they are still bad leaders and those who are incompetent if if you're incompetent you're a bad leader no matter how good your goals are no matter how good your ethics are uh, there are many things to say about this but i would because of the limitation of time i would jump into the details of um, of the uh, the five uh, practices of exemplary leaders. So let's present them. These are the five practices of exemplary leaders and uh, the rest of the lecture will be examples and details of this. First of all, number one is that they model the way. Number two is that they inspire a shared vision. Number three is that they challenge the process or the pre the, the status quo. Number four is that they enable others to act. Or if you want a, a modern term to that, it's called empowerment. And finally, they encourage the heart of, or if you want a, a more, um, a, a more precise definition. These, these are exactly used by causes and partners. But uh, if I want to change them, then I would say number five is motivation, the ability to motivate others. Uh, so let's go through them and then I will modify them as we go. Let's start with modeling the way. Model the way means that a leader practices two major practices. So there are characteristics, the five major characteristics of uh, role model leaders, and there are 10 practices. So each characteristic has two practices. So to model the way, uh, uh, we will go through the practices, but this is something that uh, they have done. Uh, uh, this is one of the results of the, this research. The, the, the number one, the most important personal quality of a leader that people look for, admire in a leader, and this is a, a research done by, as I said, Kozil and Posner on 1.5 million people, is credibility. This is the highest level where people look, that's what people look for in a leader, credibility. This is the number one characteristic every year throughout 30 years. And it is the number one characteristic in every country. Always, it is credibility. So that uh, led them to write another book besides the Leadership Challenge by the title of Credibility. In, the, in their book, Credibility, they describe what is the, uh, credibility by saying credibility is, uh, let's, uh, uh, let me go back. Credibility to them is two words, two words, and that is trustworthy, Truth telling, that is credibility. As-Sadiq Al-Ameen. Now, if we go to the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, before he was a prophet, when he was 40 years old, before that, if you read any book of seerah, and you will see that he was called by his people before he became a prophet, 
الصادق الامين and when i say trustworthy truth telling this is not from me this is these are the exact words used by causes and personal so this is the highest uh, characteristic for being uh, a leader and a model leader to have this credibility and in short you are trustworthy and you are truth truth telling you and this we will uh, we will go into the details of that and they were asked also this question and these uh, the answers were from the six continents every country in the world almost and they were asked what are the most important seven characteristics they admire in a leader and the highest answers with percentages are the following number one is honest or credible number two is forward looking or having a vision number three is inspiring or the ability to motivate others number four is competent they know what they're doing and number five is intelligent these numbers change every year but the they the number one which is honest or credible is always number one the other two, uh, the other four, they alternate in, in sometimes number two becomes three, sometimes uh, fourth becomes two, but number one continues to be number one, and that is credibility. Now, how do we practice this role model? Uh, it is by two major things. Number one is they have values and they clarify their values to their followers. People, people believe that this leader have values and they set the example of practicing these values. So they have clear values and they practice these clear, clear values. There is an, a huge encyclopedia uh, called Nadratun Naim. Nadratun Naim. It is about uh, 13 volumes. And it is, this whole encyclopedia is only about the the ethics of the Prophet I have also written a book on Rasul al-Insan, the human side of the Prophet. Not we're not talking the prophetic side, not uh, as a military leader or a, or a political leader, which he was all, but just the human side. He was the example. And every one of us know this, but I'll, just to give any, some examples of Sira that maybe uh, some people will add to their uh, collection of stories that are very important. One day the Prophet Sallallahu was uh, coming back from one of the battles, leading an army of 30,000. In the way back to Mecca, to Medina, the Prophet Sallallahu suddenly ordered the whole army to stop in, in the middle of nowhere. And they were surprised, why are we stopping? And then the Prophet Sallallahu did an, an investigation in asking about something that was very, very strange. There was a wild pigeon that was flapping its wings. And the Prophet Sallallahu said to his followers, this pigeon is telling me that somebody took its chicks from her nest. Who did that? And the investigation, they found one of the companions doing that, and he had the chicks. He said, why did you do that? She is a mother. And these chicks will not feed you. And he gave the chicks back to the mother putting the, the, the chicks in the, in the nest. Now imagine, imagine a whole army of 30,000 being stopped because of this great value of mercy. This is, this is how you become a role model in this. Again, there are so many stories, but my time is very short. So let me continue. The second one is inspire a shared vision. Inspire a shared vision. And to do that, to inspire a shared vision, you need to do practices. When people were asked, how do they imagine 
what is uh, vision. They always talked about a leader who showed them an exciting, highly attractive future. This is how leadership is done. You talk to your followers about a great future that we will achieve. Don't look at our present situation and the pain that we are in or the misery that we live in. Look at the bright future that is coming. Definitely, it's coming to humanity and to the Muslim world. It is coming. And the Prophet ﷺ did that so greatly, so greatly. He told them about how Islam will prevail over the world. He told them how uh, justice will prevail everywhere. He told them about the destruction of the empires who oppressed others. He talked he talked to them about the future and he showed them the attractive future that will come. And to do this, you need to do two things. You, you need to envision the future and you need to enlist these people in believing in this future. Let me give you a story. Again, I'm trying to use my time to, to give you science of leadership and Sira of the Prophet that's with with the new stories that uh, some people might not know. Have you ever heard about a war that stops be because one soldier was killed? I'm not talking about a leader. Of course, many many wars would stop because a leader is killed, but how many wars in history stopped because one leader, uh, one soldier, not a leader, was killed? This happened only once in history. And that is in the battle that happened between the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu And that is on the year uh, 40 of Hijrah. And that, in that year, uh, one of the soldiers in the army of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an, was Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu an. Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu an. Ammar ibn Yasir, I'm, I'm sorry, these noises are, uh, I think people are uh, doing fireworks outside <laughs> my house, uh, which is rare, I don't know why. <laughs> so uh, uh, Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu an, was 92 years old, but he still believed that Ali radiallahu an was on the, on the correct side, on the truthful side. So he joined him. The Prophet sallallahu told them about, what well, they told the companions at his time about the future. The Prophet sallallahu had already died. Uh, this battle is on the year 40 of Hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ died on the year, beginning of the year 11 of Hijrah. So we're talking 20 years later. He told them, them that whoever kills Ammar is on the wrong side of the truth. So this hadith was known to all Muslims. And when the battle started and Ammar was on the side of Ali. And he was 92 years old. He couldn't even, <laughs> he could hardly carry a sword. And whenever he walks towards the other army, the whole army would flee from him, fearing to kill him. Because if they kill him, then they are on the wrong side of the truth. <laughs> and that continued for a few days until the other side killed him by mistake. And the whole war stopped because both sides knew that the Prophet ﷺ told them the future and he told them what will happen. And they believed in this future. And that continues continuously. Uh, as, as a quick note, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an, was a great scholar and uh, one of the great scholars of the companions. And he, after living in Medina with the Prophet Sallallahu he later on lived in Kufa in Iraq. And one day there was a, 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 
a huge sandstorm that was orange in color and almost nobody could see. So a man ran to Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas and he said, Ibn Abbas, the day of judgment just started. <laughs> That's how we imagine the day of judgment. So Abdullah ibn Abbas said, no, the day of judgment have not started and will not start unless this and this and this and this will happen. So many, many, unfortunately, many Muslims today live with the idea that the day of judgment is almost here. It is not here. It is not even close because the signs of the day of judgment is uh, there are a lot of them that would need centuries to, to happen. And so we are not living at the end of the time. And by the way, this is not my opinion. This is my opinion, the opinion also of my teacher, Dr. Yusuf al qaradawi and if, if you know the details of the signs, then you know we're not living in that. So the Prophet ﷺ told them about the, the near future, 20 years from his life, and he told them about the day of judgment and whatever major events in between, and they believed in it. And it is uh, passed to us today. So this is how much we believe in the vision of the Prophet ﷺ. And then we go to the third major characteristic and that's challenge the process. To challenge the process, you need to, uh, to show others that you do not accept the status quo. And, uh, you need new methods, new ideas, and continuously reinvent the organization that you're leading. Do not, do not accept it as it is. And uh, to, to do that, you need to search for opportunities and you need to experiment and take risks and learn from, exper uh, from these exper experiences. Let me give you an example of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Most Muslims know that the Prophet ﷺ was, uh, during the 13 years that he, uh, the first 13 years of Islam, when he was living in Mecca, he was oppressed and his ideas and his followers were oppressed until the 10th year of the message, when his uncle who protected him died, and his wife, the great uh, woman of uh, example of, uh, of a leader also, Sayyid Khadija anha, died. And this year was called the year of sadness. And the oppression became even more because nobody protected the Prophet. So now he needs to find something else. And by the way, most Muslims don't know that during the 13 years of uh, the first 13 years of Islam, only 150 people embraced Islam. In, in the first 13 years, only 150 embraced Islam. Yeah, just imagine that. We are, we are talking about close to 12 a year or so. <laughs> that is all, one, one person a month. <laughs> your Mac organization get more than that. <laughs> so, who would continue with the message with such results? But he believed in it. And then he saw that there is the oppression in Mecca was huge and he needs to look for another opportunity. And he has to take risks. He has to take a risk. So he decided to go to the closest city and that is life. This is a known story to most Muslims, but most Muslims don't know the rest of the story or the details of the story. The first uh, detail of the story is that the Prophet ﷺ never entered Taif. He never entered Taif. He was he reached the the edge of Taif, and the leaders of Taif saw him and ordered their slaves and the the children to stone him. So he never entered Taif. So he, he went back to Mecca. And most Muslims, unfortunately, don't know that when he reached Mecca, the leaders of Mecca, with their swords and uh, weapons, stood in his way, refusing to let him back into Mecca. So he could not enter Mecca. What a, a risk he was taking. It was a huge risk. He was going to explore an opportunity in Taif, and he was risking not coming back to Mecca. 
which both happened. He could not find the opportunity in Taif and he was not able to come back to Mecca until one of the leaders of Mecca said it is, it is unor uh, honorable to have one of the sons of the leaders of Mecca, Muhammad, not allowed into Mecca. So he protected him and brought him back. His name was Al-Mut'am ibn Adi. So <laughs> a leader who does not look for a new opportunities, who does not take risks, who, who accepts the status quo, who just continues what we have been doing for years, is not a leader, is not a model leader at least. Number four, enable others to act. And uh, this is, again, leadership is a team effort. And uh, everyone has strengths. And uh, unfortunately, most people don't see the, the weaknesses in themselves. So to do this, you need to do two things. You need to foster collaboration among your followers. And you need to strengthen others. And you do this by by a major thing, you empower people, you, you give them the ability to act. And let me give you an example that some people might not know out of Syria. The Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam had uh, military leaders leading his armies. One of the great military leaders was Khalid Ibn al-Walid, radiyallahu an, great name in Islam. He embraced Islam on the seventh year of Hijrah, three years just before the death of the Prophet So because of his genius, the Prophet made him lead armies four months only after he embraced Islam. So he did not look at how many years of experience he had in Islam or how many years in the organization. He looked at his strengths. So he appointed him and he gave him Empowerment. He gives him a, a mission and then he leaves him to act. Of course, when you give people the, uh, the, the opportunity to act, sometimes they make mistakes. And Khalid made a huge mistake, just a huge mistake. When he went to the tribe of Bani Judaima and he killed them, not knowing that they are already embraced Islam. It's, it's a long story. Anyway, it was a mistake. So what did the Prophet ﷺ do? The Prophet ﷺ took the hand of Khalid, raised it, and said, Oh Allah, I am innocent of what Khalid has done. This is not my action. I do not agree with what he, done, he has done. And he repeated that three times. This is known. It's a very well-known story. But most people don't look what happened after that. The Prophet ﷺ did two things. He paid the people, the families of the people who were killed. Every one of them. He paid for them until they were satisfied. The second thing that he did is that he let Khalid continue to lead. To lead, you must trust in your people. And if they make mistakes, you correct the mistake, but you do not punish them for the mistake. Otherwise, you, you don't empower them. And the Prophet ﷺ did that. In the last few minutes, I would talk about the last uh, characteristic of a great, a great leader, and that is the, to encourage the hearts and uh, uh, to motivate others, in short. So uh, you need to, uh, to climb to the top making people who are exhausted believe in themselves, believe in their ideas, believe in their uh, creed and continue uh, going forward towards the vision, growing uh, people until they are assured that they can do it. To do that, you need to uh, do things. You need to recognize individual contributions and you need to celebrate teamwork and values. And the Prophet ﷺ was the greatest in this. The Prophet ﷺ always gave his uh, 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 moral uh, support to any great act that individuals did and groups did. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, encouraged them 
in um, monetary uh, uh, contributions, he gave them uh, positions, he etc. But he gave it only to those who deserve it, and not to those who do not deserve it. Of course, there are many, many stories of the Sira. Uh, my time is almost up. I have two more minutes left. So in conclusion, I would say leadership is, is not somebody's business or the country's or the government's business or the or the uh, uh, association of leadership business. It is the business of everyone, especially parents, by the way. And it is something that you can learn, you can acquire. You, we can teach young men and women and children how to be leaders. And you need to you know yourself and lead yourself first so that you can be able to lead others to be leaders. Remember that values and faith are the essence of leadership. And this sentence is not mine. This is a sentence that I quoted from Causes and Posner. And look at this. And how is this truly is found in the life of the Prophet He lived around values and he lived according to deep faith. The Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the model of leaders. Try, fail, learn leadership. Surround yourself with leaders, not with followers. And remember that leadership, true leadership, is self-leadership or self-development. And caring is the heart of leadership. And again, this is something that is quoted from Causes and Posner. And Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the ultimate example of leadership, and that is my quote to you. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you for your invitation. I am exactly 40 minutes from uh, since I started, and uh, I leave it to the moderator, and it is my pleasure to be with you always. Inshallah, you benefited out of that, and inshallah, we will follow the path of the Prophet وسلم, and become the, the individuals and the leaders that he wished for. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khair and uh, Dr. Tariq Sudan, that was a very informative and, and beautiful presentation of uh, a sampling of, of the great lessons of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I just remind everyone the verse uh, recited in the beginning from Surah Al-Ahzab, indeed in the Messenger of Allah, you have an excellent example for whoever has hope in Allah in the last day and remembers Allah often. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. If there are any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we can continue for a short time as long as we have the company of our dear uh, scholar. A uh, quick reminder, this is a free program, the Max Scholars Summit, uh, inviting many of the great leaders and influencers to teach us during this, uh, this period of break. The program started yesterday and continues until January the 2nd. The schedule is online. Um, please feel free to join and uh, also to subscribe to the channel to get notifications so you can get the updated lectures. We are streaming live in, in the three languages, English, uh, Arabic and French. Uh, throughout the program, inshallah. So we look forward to uh, your ongoing uh, support and attention. I would like to invite everyone to, to provide any questions uh, to the Sheikh for us to uh, to have. There is one question very much related to what you just mentioned. The uh, question comes from how we can plant leadership in our children so they're not followers of others in bad friendships. Uh, and really, you know, uh, Dr. Suelan, in, in Canada, so the country is in a lockdown because of the virus. Uh, our children are home. Um, you know, we have we have we have find ways to give them good examples and and good things to learn from and follow. What advice do you have uh, to help us establish these attributes in our young children? There are things that we need to to do. To um, uh, this is the this is the uh, uh, major roles of leadership that we can instill in our children and young men and women also. Number one is to train them to analyze. Train them to analyze. Among all the characteristics that I've studied and I've trained uh, people on, the most important quality is the ability to analyze. If you can analyze people, if you can analyze situations, if you can analyze uh, organizations, and all of these things can be taught, can be learned. So you talk to your children, you talk to the young men and women uh, about 
characters, uh, characters that they see on uh, TV. So what do you think about this person? What are the good things about them? What is the bad things about them? Et cetera. Whether they are political leaders or even uh, uh, characters in a movie, whatever. So train them to analyze, continuously to analyze. That's one. Number two, give them courage. Courage is a must for a leader. And now courage is two ways. Courage in fear situations, but there is another kind of courage that you can do even at home. And that is the courage to speak up, to speak their mind, to criticize. Uh, many parents hate their <laughs> children to, to speak up or to criticize or uh, to, um, to correct them, for example. No, don't do that. Accept that. This is courage. And by the way, this is courage and being able to analyze. When they, when they criticize you, they're doing two things. They are thinking and at the same time, they're speaking up. So if they speak up, if they talk, if they, if they criticize, accept it. Don't refuse it. Otherwise, you will crush criticism in them. Third thing that you can do is instill in them ambition continuously talk to them about the future. What do you want to be in the future? And don't, don't accept a simple answer. I want to be a physician or an engineer or whatever. No, no, go into the details. So if you become an, a physician, what will you do? What do you hope to achieve? So make them think about the future. The more they think about the future, the more visionary they will become. So make sure that you give them the chance to be ambitious. The last thing, there are many, but I'm just, uh, the last thing is uh, to encourage them to have initiatives, even small initiatives. If, in, uh, if they have an idea, don't mark these ideas. If they are creative about anything, don't mark their creativity. Uh, if, um, if, uh, if they can start an organization or even a committee in their school, uh, if you, for example, go into a demonstration for human rights or women's rights or whatever, Palestine, etc., uh, uh, take them with you. Um, and since I mentioned this, I would emphasize that we as Muslims are never against the Jews. We are never against the Jews. Jews lived with us for centuries peacefully. I, in, in even when I did my research on history, in, in Jewish books, it is written, the best time for the Jews in history was the time when they lived under Muslim leadership or uh, Muslim countries in Spain, when Muslims go 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 govern Spain. And that is the, the highest they ever reached. We are against Zionism. We are against oppression. We are against occupation but not against any other religion. So uh, teach them, teach them values, teach them, uh, teach them um, uh, activism in, in, uh, according to these values. So these are some of the things that you can do to instill leadership in, in your children. Dr. Murphy, that was excellent uh, advice for, uh, for every parent but, uh, who struggles with this, inshallah. Another question, we'll, we'll continue. Uh, we have some, some extra time, inshallah, for, for some more questions. Sure. If there are any, please forward them, uh, and we'll uh, ask the, our, our beloved Sheikh. One question comes from uh, the, the really the role of women, and how can women become leaders while fighting the false view of, of Muslims on you know, this quote that Muslims should, Muslim women should not be too socially involved in the community because of issues such as modesty? Um, how do you reconcile this and, and advise, advise our young women and sisters to be uh, in leadership. Uh, again, this is one of my coming books, and that is woman leadership. And there is a huge research on this. Uh, again, there is no time to go through all of this research or even some of it. But let me let me answer the question directly. There is no contradiction between leadership and modesty. There is no contradiction. The most modest among all women in Islam were the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And 
their modesty was special in the sense that a Muslim woman, for example, is ordered to wear hijab. While the wives of the Prophet وسلم, in the sixth year of Hijrah, four years before the death of the Prophet وسلم, were ordered not to see any man except their close relatives unless they, are, they talk to them behind walls or curtains. They cannot see men, men cannot see them. So this is the, again, how, how much modesty you can reach more than that. That, even that, did not stop Sayyida Aisha from, from leadership. And she was a leader of a whole army. She led the army. And in her army, her followers were great, great names like Talha and Az Zubair, great fighters of Islam, one of the 10 companions granted heaven. And she led them. And by the way, when she led them, she went with them to the war and she was covered. She, they could not see her, but she gave speeches. And everyone could hear her. So again, modesty does not stop you from becoming a leader. You don't have to do this. You can go to society, you can be with men, you can give speeches, you can take any position. You, By the way, you can take the position of even a prime minister or a leader of a country. There's nothing to stop a woman from reaching any position. And it is... It is, when, when we say modesty, modesty is something in your heart and in your actions. But it is not something that will stop you from leadership. Father. We'll just do another follow-up question. Uh, you, you mentioned a lot about the relationship between leaders and the followers. And uh, the question came up that if the leader's goals are different than what the followers want, how can we deal with this? Okay, um, there is a huge science, a new science called uh, followership. This is a new science, and it studies followership and uh, and it asks a major question: Who makes the others? Who do 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 leaders make followers, or do the followers make the leader? <laughs> and uh, studies have shown that the effect of, le of followers on leaders are more than the effect of leaders on followers. So that said, an another major, uh, major uh, uh, research found, founding uh, lately is that followers are not one kind. There are several kinds of followers. In my own research, I divided followers into eight kinds of followers. And uh, I have done a series in Arabic on that. It's found on YouTube, Asrar al So, uh, uh, again, because there are different kinds of followers, you will see that sometimes some of these followers do not go along with leaders 100%. There are followers who go 100%. Let's take two examples to clarify this. Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was a follower who would follow the Prophet Sallallahu and never contradict him never object to his orders, never question anything he says. And he was, a, the one, again, the greatest follower. Now, the second greatest follower was Umar. Umar, radiallahu an, objected to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa so many times. You just don't, ima you, the, the number of times he objected to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa that were mentioned in the Quran were eight times. Eight times he objected to the Prophet Sallallahu And by the way, many people don't know this. And every time of the eight, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, Umar was correct. So this is a follower who does not follow blindly, who would correct even his leader, telling him, you shouldn't do it this way. You should do it this way. And the Quran blessed his ideas and standings. Now, 
Outside the Quran, there are so many examples also where he objected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But that, that does not make him a follower. He was still a, a great follower. So it depends on your understanding of followership. If you think that followership is, a, is something blind that you just follow, that, then you're looking at one kind of followership. But there are eight kinds of followership. Now, definitely, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was great. But definitely also, Sayyidina Umar was great. So you could be one of two followers. If you truly believe in your leader and whatever they do, then follow. But if you believe in your leader, but you believe that they sometimes make mistakes, then speak up. And both are accepted in Islam and both are great examples of great followers in Islam. So. Excellent, Jazakallah uh, khair again. Uh, really excellent questions coming in and wonderful responses as well. I'd like to thank the, the audience for their excellent questions and of course... Uh, yeah, just, excellent questions, Sahih. Uh, one question came up was if you recognize uh, leadership attributes in someone or in a child, for example, or even in, in, you know, how can we develop or harness those leadership attributes into becoming really uh, successful, you know, beneficial leaders for our community? Uh, do you have any books to recommend, any programs? Yes. Is it different for different ages and different types okay. of leadership? Uh, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Let me, first of all, uh, if you want to write with me, there are eight characteristics, eight, that if we recognize, and I gave you the signs, if we recognize that this young man or woman or this child has the ability to become a leader, which are uh, rem reminding you, uh, the ability to analyze, having courage, uh, having ambitions, um, uh, being serious about life is one of them. They don't, they don't waste their time, they use their time correctly, etc. There are others. Now, after recognizing this, then we need to train them to be leaders. How do we train them to be leaders? The, 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 the training model goes like this. You must first of all decide what are the roles a leader will do, meaning that suppose we train somebody, after, they, after we finish training, what will they do? So we look at the end first, and the eight roles of a leader are the following. The ability to plan is number one. Being a role model to, to, to the followers, credibility. Number three, the ability to motivate his followers. Number four, change and creativity. Number five, training. The ability to train and develop his or her followers. Number six, ability to build strong relations inside the organization and outside. Number seven, delegation and empowerment. And number eight is the ability to manage and make decisions. So knowing the roles, then we need to specify the competencies that we need to train them on to be able to achieve these roles. And these competencies are specified in detail. Now, uh, uh, the question is about uh, uh, resources or uh, uh, websites or uh, training programs. So I, I'll mention some. Uh, first of all, I, um, I've written uh, with uh, some of my colleagues, uh, the Encyclopedia of uh, Leadership and it is called Al-Manhaj Al-Mutakamil I'dad Al-Qada. So the, this is the integrated curriculum to train future leaders. It is currently in Arabic, but I would welcome your help in translating into English. It is in three volumes. Um, so this is, this is a major research that has been published uh, recently. And in that we collected everything and we added our experience of training leaders. Now, uh, we are building currently, uh, and inshallah we will launch in 2021, uh, a new center, a, a global center on leadership training. Uh, this center called the Ruwad uh, will help any society, any city, any country, 
to start a leadership center in their community. And we will provide for you the curriculum. We will provide for you the website. We will provide for you the, the program activities recommended, the bylaws, etc. cetera. So, uh, so inshallah, very soon we will launch a ruad. If, uh, if uh, any of you is in charge of leadership development, please be in touch with me. I will give you the number of my student who is in charge of this program. A third program that we do, uh, the, uh, by the way, Ruad is uh, something that can be done locally. Uh, currently, 25 uh, cities already applied to be to start a leadership center in their cities, and we are helping them to do that. Uh, so this is even before we start. Uh, uh, a third program that I would recommend strongly, uh, it is uh, the Leadership Academy that we do in summertime. And it is usually uh, two to three weeks, uh, about 18 days, uh, that I do the training myself. Uh, I do about 60% of the training, and uh, there are other trainers who do the rest. And uh, it, it, is, uh, uh, it is a very intensive training uh, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. <laughs> and uh, we do it usually in Istanbul uh, in August every year. And it is available for men and women, uh, from uh, young men and women from the ages of 18 to 27. The next year, we will uh, extend it to 30 years old because we have stopped because of the corona, et cetera. So 18 to 30, and it is called the uh, Academy at Adad al And um, uh, currently it's in Arabic, but I am already developing the program in English, inshallah, and we are doing uh, the, the program with MAC in Canada to start what we call a Pioneers Center uh, about leadership. Uh, we have more than that. We have uh, leadership programs for, um, uh, for middle school. We have leadership programs for high school. And this, you can find them in Academiat Konuz. This is middle school and high school. Uh, both sexes, and uh, you'll, see, you'll see a full program. We do programs online, and we have camps also for them in the summer. Uh, by the way, we do also uh, leadership programs for KG. We start, we start leadership training from, year, uh, from age two to six, and we have two nurseries called the Hadanat Iadad al Qada. So leadership, uh, by the way, the best way <laughs> ages is two to six, because this is where the personalities develop. So all of this is available. And uh, again, we need committed people who are serious about starting such programs. Uh, please contact me and I will provide the programs or I'll give them the, uh, the numbers of the brothers or sisters who are in charge of this. Excellent, I want to respect your time as well, Dr. Aswandi. No, we have I'm, I'm a few more questions. Yeah. No, take your time. It is, it is your decision, not mine. I, no, I have all the time for, in the world for you. Mashallah, we're, we're very blessed and fortunate. Uh, my, this is a, a, a great program running across the country, across the world for, for anyone mm -hmm. who's, uh, who's registering. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you and the other great uh, scholars. This is Thank a good you. question um, to follow up. Uh, people who are in leadership positions, uh, how do we ensure that they remain humble and do not start developing arrogance or a feeling of, uh, being better than other people or being entitled. And uh, related to this question actually is some people enter into leadership roles and then never leave, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, from the low levels to the highest levels of leadership, yeah. uh, if you know You're what I mean. Talking, yeah, we, we have this in our part of the world more than you. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you, how do you, what's the balance? Thank you. This is something that was also researched deeply. Uh, and uh, the, the research is done under um, the science of bad leadership. There's a new science now called bad leadership. And I, I mentioned very little about bad leadership. Um, again, uh, bad leadership, if you have bad goals or bad ethics or incompetent. Now, the research goes further than that and ask uh, some questions that are related to your questions. And uh, one of the major questions is, why do people follow bad leaders? 
and it is proven that 71% of people will follow bad leaders willingly. So it is the problem in the people. Now, this is one research. Another uh, thing is, how do we stop bad leaders? How do we stop them from achieving leadership positions? And uh, the third question is, if we find um, somebody in a leadership position and we discover that they are bad leaders, how do we remove them? So uh, all of these questions are researched. And I would, if you are interested, I would advise you to read a book called Bad Leadership by Barbara Kellerman, K-E-L-L-E-R-M-A-N. Barbara Kellerman, Dr. Barbara Kellerman have written excellent books, just outstanding books. One of them, again, is a followership also. And I read almost all her books. She is the professor of leadership in Harvard. And she is the chairman of the Leadership Institute in Harvard. Um, so there is an excellent research. Uh, I've summarized her work and others in, in my training programs. But in short, uh, <clears throat> the best way, uh, uh, there is no way to ensure that a, a leader will become humble. <laughs> Being humble. Uh, uh, Sayyidina Hassan al-Basri was asked, what is being humble? What is humble? And he said, humble is something in the heart. It is not in the actions. It is something in the heart. And he, they say, how do we know if we are humble or not? He said, if you want to know that you're humble or not, whenever you meet anyone, you would feel that they are better than you then you know you're humble. So how do you ensure that somebody has in their heart this issue? There's no way to ensure it. But the way to, to stop bad leadership, the best way that is proven today is to have a limit on number of years or number of terms. And the, the, the general acceptance among scholars is two terms. So any leader in any position should not stay in that position more than two terms. Now, most terms are four years, but some countries have five and some countries have six, but not more than that. So this is the way to ensure that they will live peacefully. <laughs> uh, and we stop, uh, uh, we, say it in the, we say the following, we stop having kingdoms, even in Islamic world, by the way. Uh, again, we were very uh, blessed to have you with us and to share your wisdom and time. Uh, I think it is uh, fair to close. We've, we've uh, had the session for more than an hour now, and uh, we want to value and appreciate everybody's time, and especially yours. Uh, at this time, I'd like to thank you know for the the time that you spent with us. Obviously, uh, commercial free, and uh, you know your your own perspective to share with us. Uh, we are accepting donations from uh, if anyone's interested at uh, macnet.ca slash donate uh, to provide this programming for you. And we'd like to thank all the organizers, especially uh, people who put this program together, as well as our live translators, uh, Brother Khaled Jarrar, who translated in Arabic, and uh, Sister Mary Bittar, who translated in French. And uh, at this time, uh, again, thank you everyone uh, for participating. I just want to I emphasize I'm free of charge. <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> It's uh, a great a great blessing. So we, we've been able to do this, and inshallah, we can continue. Please uh, follow the channel and uh, listen in, uh, get notifications, and the program will be continuously running. The next session is tonight at 8 p.m. with Dr. Ihan Badr. I hope everyone can join. Uh, with this, I'd like to, again, thank Dr. Tariq Sridan from uh, Kuwait. Uh, please you, give us a uh, closing dua for the uh, this session, inshallah. Uh, please, and uh, we will close. الحمد لله بارك الله فيكم اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم أحسن إلينا في الدنيا والآخرة يا رب العالمين وأحسن إلى أولادنا وذرياتنا واجعلهم من قادة الأمة الذين يصلحون الأحوال ويمنعون الفساد ويصنعون التاريخ بإذن الله تعالى اللهم 
بارك في ماك والقائمين عليها والداعمين لها وبارك في كل من شارك في هذا البرنامج نسال الله سبحانه وتعالى لكم الرفعه في الدنيا والاخره والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله